doing reviews on the games that we're going to be looking at and, and play testing and doing some wonderful little bits and pieces. We're also going to, sorry, just run up the stairs. And if you're wondering why I'm wearing a hoodie, um, it's because it is so cold at the moment, our heating's not working properly, and, uh, and it's about to snow or it's about to rain. One of the two, I don't know which, because they've said it's gonna snow, but it seems to be pouring down with rain outside. So, what have we been up to? Well, since the last time I spoke to you, uh, we've been looking at uh, Werewolf the Apocalypse, we've been playing a number of games. Now, in some of these segments, I wanna talk about our role-playing group. I want to be able to communicate the things that I find difficult and the things that have been really, really exciting to watch because uh, I'm having to look at it because I've got all their names written down on there. Um, <clears throat> and they've got some wonderful character names. So it's been quite it's been quite exciting because these guys have never played Werewolf the Apocalypse or any, uh, probably any of the White Wolf system. I think Mike's about the only one that has. And um, it's been quite exciting and strange and kind of... Uh, I'm trying to find the right word without sounding too rude. Uh, uh, intense, like trying to deal with how they do stuff. So when you've got someone that's never role played before, they kind of do the most mentalist things, and which they think is quite acceptable, even though they wouldn't do it in real life. And one of our things is, well, would you do that in real life? And they go, oh no. But again, it's a role playing game, so you know you're not going to be running around with flechette weapons and rocket launchers and. Uh, you know, samurai monofilament swords, or, or you know, you're not going to be a 16 foot or 13 foot werewolf. Um, so it's been quite interesting to see how the new players um, evolved into what they are now. Okay, so some of them come from like DD backgrounds. DD is kind of different to the world of Warhammer, uh, to the world of uh, 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 World of Darkness because. You're kind of playing like in some games the anti-hero. For example, we played Vampire first. I wanted to get them into it and I thought Vampire would be a lot easier because it's not as complicated as uh, Werewolf the Apocalypse in the sense that you've got all these different forms that you can take as a werewolf from human down to lupus to wolf form. You know, you've got like, there's five stages that you can go through. So, um, and that includes if you include human in it. But I wanted them to try and get into an understanding of the world of darkness because the world of darkness isn't a sunny beautiful uh green green fielded place it's dark it's raining a lot it's i kind of push it across as like the blade runner world uh so it's dark and gloomy uh when the sun comes out it's not really bright bright but it's out there it can be seen uh, it's still cloudy and over you know overcast um you know the streets are dark uh, the lighting is illuminated by street lights during the night, uh, creating warped and crazy looking shadows and stuff like that. You know, the alleyways are, are probably littered with rubbish. Uh, there's a mass of humanity traveling around all over the place and writhing all over the place sort of thing, you know. So there's a constant hum. The city's never really asleep. So I wanted the guys to kind of get that in their head and kind of understand what was going on. But I think Vampire for them was a little bit too Machiavellian, too politically driven, and it was hard for them to get into their characters because they just saw it as a kind of a joke to mess around with and, and just didn't really get it. But that's not their fault because maybe it was my fault as a storyteller, really not trying to push it onto them. And I found myself getting quite frustrated that they just weren't getting into the whole process of, you know, it's dark, you know, you're a vampire, you know, there's misery involved within that. You know, there's loss, tragedy and stuff. And, and you watch loved ones, you know, you either have to leave loved ones or you watch loved ones die as they age. And they were playing young vampires and they never really sort of really got into it. So I kind of stopped the campaign when they all got killed uh, in one of the stories. And I think it was Chicago by night we were playing. And uh, I kind of said, look, you know, let's put a stop on this. Let's not do vampire. Let's play something a little bit different that I think you might get into. Now, we've been playing Werewolf the Apocalypse. Now, Werewolf the Apocalypse is a completely different game. Because the tough part about Werewolf the Apocalypse is it's just not about 
you know, running around, ripping people to pieces and, you know, smashing things, me, werewolf, me, bash, you know, there's a whole spiritual side to the game, there's a whole, you know, stepping into the spiritual world and communicating with spirits, travelling the, you know, the humble pathways, uh, you know, seeking adventure in there, so there's not just the mundane world, you can do, you can shift between two different worlds, so there's effectively two different types of games that you're playing. And, you know, it's been kind of cool seeing how they've developed. Now, we started off with the book's Rite of Passage, which is which is an awesome, you know, starter story to get all your players involved and stuff like that. And then we made sure that we did a, a starter story for each one of the players. Now, there's five players. Um, and each one of them had their own sort of origin story that we all role played and, you know, we brought them into the pack sort of thing. Now, the idea was that they're gathered um, and brought together and taken to the Sept of the Green in New York City. Now, that was kind of complicated for them because then they also had to understand that there's a hierarchy system. And you get a lot of players that don't like being told what to do. Uh, or you get people that don't like being told what to do, which is kind of funny because... Werewolves are like modelled on wolf packs. So you have an alpha and you have a beta. And you have, within that, there's a hierarchy system. The alpha always eats first, then his right hand man, and then the rest work down the, you know, down the line sort of thing. And, you know, the, 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 the stragglers get to feast last, whatever's left. So it kind of works exactly the same in the werewolf community. You know, you don't, you know, even though, some werewolves, because of their tribal natures, act differently to everybody else. In Werewolf the Apocalypse, uh, you kind of have a ranking system where the alphas are right at the top and, you know, they show dominance and stuff. And players have to sort of, oh, you know, I'm sorry, you know, cower down. And, you know, you, uh, the idea is that you, when you watch a wolf pack, you see the alpha, you know, it's very really, up front and stuff. And, and the, the others are over their heads or the tails are between their legs and stuff. You know, they never look them in the eyes or they roll over and stuff. So you kind of get that not so much rolling over, but there is a gift that makes them do that, which is awesome. But it kind of brings that whole sort of like you have to bring that to the game you have to bring that oh, i'm really sorry you know yeah oh yes you know yes uh you know uh, uh you know yeah i'm very sorry you know like you know you have to bring that in there when it was kind of interesting we did the rites of passage because uh, our characters i'll just sort of go for our characters so we've got ahmed lopez who's a, a silent strider uh, he, you know, he's been he's sort of been brought up in homes and stuff, but he always knew there was more to his world than what it is, and he, he kind of saw strange things. and uh, And he's the theurge, so he's the spirit talker. Um, and these are all homage. We're all playing homage because I just think it's a bit too difficult for them straight away to play a Metis and play or play a Lupus because it's just too much to ask for them because they've got to get into the whole mindset of actually, you know, if you've never role played before, and you know. Like I said, a couple of them haven't role played before, but a couple of them have played D&D &D, and it's only one that actually knows much about the world of darkness. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to see how they interact with each other. Now, I gave them all a tribe book. So they all got a tribe book each uh, that they could read for before we started playing, just so they could get their heads around how, they, how each tribe sees the world and stuff like that. Um, because, you know, the werewolves were broken up into uh, 12 tribes, or 13 tribes, I think it is. Or maybe more, I don't know, I can't remember. Um, and each tribe has its own outlook of how they see the world and, and what their purpose is there. Even though they all serve the common good, they still get tribal wars and stuff like that. So, I'm kind of trying to get them into the whole aspect sort of thing. Now this is, it's kind of cool watching them doing their thing uh, and it's been kind of interesting to see how they interact with each other. Okay, so you've got Lopez, who's uh, Ahmed Lopez, who's a silent strider, and he's the Theos. You know, you've got um, um, Uthred uh, uh, Erikusson, who is the Geta Fenris, uh, and he's an Arun. He's like the born under the warrior sign, and and uh, they kind of call him Red because it's just easier to 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 uh, to call him. Basically, it's his nickname, Red. You know, uh, and you know he's a 
you know, he, he kind of tries to use his words, you know, to solve things. Uh, you know, he's very sort of grumpy and, you know, uh, a typical get a Fenris, basically. If you can think about any kind of warrior, you know, that's basically like a barbarian type character, you know, in modern day life. So he struggled on the streets as a backstory. You know, his, his dad used to beat him up all the time. And then one day he has his change and realises that his parents are like... Banes basically have been inhabited by Banes and this is why he's been treated so badly and he, he loses it and rages and turns into this into his Krynos form and ends up killing his parents um, uh, and you know and then realizes what's happened and, and then is found by uh, you know the, the rest of the Gar some of the Garu in New York, New York City and brought to the Sept of the Green. So they've all been gathered to the Sept of the Green and then we've got um, um, who else we got? We've got uh, Arcady uh, Kanak, Kanak, I think it is, or uh, Arcady, Arcady Kanak, and he's a Silver Fang. He's uh, uh, a quiet character. He's sort of like you know born born from no, noble birth, so his family are quite rich and stuff like that. And he's come he's come into being a werewolf, knowing that that's his lineage, knowing that one day it was going to happen because he kind of knows stuff. Um, and he plays the Ragbash, and he's a bit of a funny character in the sense. Now, the Ragbashers are supposed to be tricksters, okay? But he's very clever in the sense of how he plays his character. He sort of lets everybody else do the work uh, and then comes in at the last moment to save the day. Or, you know, he's kind of there to, to, to come on, we've got to do this. Let's get in there. Let's, you know, let's see what it is. And he's kind of, he's very um, uh, subtle in the way that he deals with his stuff. Uh, and it's been quite cool watching him play because he's he's slowly getting people to sort of get into his mindset of, look, really, rush in there? You know, let's just think about this. <laughs> you know, let's talk. And he's quite a... I think that's because the player who's playing him has role-played before. Okay, so he kind of understands how the process works. And then we've got our uh, uh, Glasswalker. Now, our Glasswalker is uh, called uh, Macross, also known as Digital Echo. Now, he's... He's a Philodox. Now, the Philodox uh, job is, you know, talker of the ancient ways sort of thing. He's, uh, you know, the law, in, you know, he provides the law. He lays down the information that, you know, don't do that because if you do that, it's wrong. You're going to, you know, you're going to break the veil. And the veil's there to protect all of the werewolves. It's a set of rules that they live by. Um, and he's a really cool character. He, you know, he's uh, well dressed. Uh, he's young. They're all young. You know, they're all in their, their teens. They're well, you know, he's well dressed. He's 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 done well at school. You know, he, he wants to be a lawyer when he's older um, and he kind of enjoys the corporate life. He comes from a very big corporate uh, background. His family are corporate people. Uh, and so that's how he's come into the story. This player has never played role play games in his life. OK. And there's a and and it was kind of evident when you were playing Werewolf uh, Vampire that he was really struggling uh, to get into it. And even though he really desperately wanted to to be part of it, he he struggled with it. And that's no fault of his. That's because he just couldn't get his head around it. So in Werewolf, there's a fantastic uh, merit and flaw that you can take where basically the GM can sort of go, "Don't do that." It's, you know, it's like an ancestor whispering in your ear. Uh, and, and it kind of helps him. So when he sort of does stuff, he sort of looks at me and I can go, no, 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 you know, or yeah, that's cool sort of thing, you know. So it kind of helps him. Um, but he's got so much better. As we've progressed, he's got so much better. You know, he kind of now knows all the all the laws of the of the veil and the rules and stuff like that. You know, he's he's trying to be the advocate when they're talking and stuff like that and arguing and he sort of steps in and goes, hey, hey, come on. You know, look, maybe he's right, maybe you're wrong, or maybe you're right and you're right as well, but maybe, you know, we've just got to find a way to work together. So he's been kind of cool like that, and he's been there to help them uh, and move them on their way, uh, and he's slowly growing as a character and as an individual within the game. So at first he was quite sort of timid and didn't say much, now he's right in there. And it's been quite exciting, and I think he likes the werewolf more than the vampire. Uh, so that's been kind of cool. Now... We used to have a bone gnawer, um, uh, but he sacrificed himself in order to save everybody else, which was really cool because it was really weird that he, the bone gnawers are the lowest of the low out of the werewolf community. And the worst you could be is probably a, uh, a bone gnawer metis and then you're just literally scum. 
And the bone gnawers are basically seen as the lower classes in the werewolf. They're the street wolves. They, you know, they live in the homeless communities and stuff like that. They're, they, they, they're, uh, they're travellers. They sort of constantly travel around, sort of thing. And um, uh, and you cough, you you'll find like groups of bone gnawers either, you know, under a bridge or living with the homeless and stuff like that, or in you know junkyards and stuff. And they kind of represent a mangy old, a manky old sort of like junkyard dog. I guess the only way I can sort of kind of explain them. Um, and even in human form, they just look unkept and messy and stuff like that. But it was kind of weird that when we started the Rites of Passage, and it was a brilliant story, um, and that's a you know a, a supplement in itself. It's a brilliant book, that a source book that you can get. That's a, a complete adventure and has loads of bits of great information about you know how rites of passage are dealt with each individual tribe. Um, and because the whole sort of like all tribes working together, there's now multi-tribal packs where you have different uh tribes all working together within one pack uh so it was kind of cool but it was kind of funny that as soon as we started the rites of passage and this is where they come out of their comfort zone and they're thrown into the into the wilds of the north in the snowy tundras and stuff and they have to survive and you've got to remember these guys are all city wolves so to speak you know they've always lived in a city you know they haven't really had to hunt for food they've never had to survive and stuff like that and it was kind of exciting seeing how they how they dealt with that situation um and straight away there was a fight for pack dominance for pack leader and it, i mean it just kicked off straight away and they're like oh, you know they're growling and barking at each other they're fighting you know and and it was you know first of all uh it was the glass walker who stepped forward and you know the the uh, I know it's the get offenders that stepped forward and the glass walker went no and they ended up fighting uh, the glass walker beat the get offenders which was just unbelievable um, and then we had you know the silent strider go no no I'm not having that the glass I can't have a get offenders running the pack uh, so he challenged him and he won knocking the get offenders down and uh, and then the bone hall went I'm not having him leading the pack uh, I think it was just sort of, I'm not having the player leading the pack, so he stepped forward and he beat him. So the idea is that basically because each one's beat each other and the final person beats the, the, the last winner, he becomes the pack leader. And he just went, I'm pack leader. I'm, you know, he stood up and he, he did this fantastic speech. And I make, whenever we play sort of thing, we have this whole theatrical thing where we make the person stand up and introduce themselves. Even if it's like, you know, werewolf community where, you know, it's like a werewolf, a wolf may howl and another pack may hear it. It's a kind of introduction saying, look, we're coming. You know, we don't want to fight you, but we're on our way. Uh, we're just introducing ourselves. And this is what we make them do. They stand up and they announce their lineage and who they are and stuff. And it just sounds so cool. Um, and, um, and he just stepped forward and said, from that point on, he was pack leader. So they're traveling the, you know, the frozen tundras of the north and stuff like that. And then they wander up to a cave, they find a cave and they've all decided to shift into lupus form because it's easier for them to move through the snow, which made me laugh because it also became a lot harder for them to move through the snow because they're lower going through all this deep snow and stuff, but it, it made it much more, uh, much more, it made much more sense and it, and it allowed them to you to get into the process of using senses like heightened senses like being able to smell and you know see things differently and you know how to communicate and stuff so it was really really cool um and then our our silent strider theo just sort of barges into a cave and upsets a sleeping bear and they end up having to kill it and it was a horrendous fight because you know, they, they almost lost a player and there was some, you know, bloodletting there. Uh, and the pack leader, you know, the bone was furious with the silent strider, you know, for doing what he did and didn't listen and stuff. But he just went straight in there and, you know, and caused the death of an innocent creature and stuff. And that was kind of cool because, you know, straight away there's tension. I mean, we've got the tension with... You know, the Geta Fenris wanting to be the leader and, you know, the Bone Nora, who they all despise, who is the leader, you know. Um, and he kind of funneled the group. He kind of got the group to work together, which was really cool because beforehand they were like, oh, yeah, we do this. Oh, we do that. Oh, ha, ha. And it was all kind of like, no, guys, come on, you've got to focus on this. You need to focus on how you interact and how you play this game because 
you can't let, I mean, you've got to have a laugh and you've got to be able to let the players enjoy the story and do stuff, but also you've got to manage to, to keep the train rolling along because otherwise they just end up not following the story and just doing something completely random. So you've got to still have signposts uh, for the story. So anyway, let me get back to how what happened. So in their story in the Whites of Passage, they basically find a Talon of the Worm and it's within a big mining facility which is run by a subsidiary of Pentex. Now they're trying to bring this Talon back and uh, the Talon's this huge creature, it's a horrible evil creature that they're trying to, to bring back. So the guys basically um, find out about this and, and on their story they also run into their a story which brings them closer to their totem. Now we wanted it to be so, something random, we didn't want them to go, oh yeah we're going to all you know put our points together and we're going to go for a certain type of totem. I, I was the one that got to choose their totem and I and I basically wrote down a load of random numbers, uh, uh, random uh, totems from the books and I just rolled on it and they got the bear. Now the bear is a totem of war um, but um, he gives strength and he gives uh, care as well you know the the totem is a fantastic the bear totem is a fantastic totem to have okay you you gain respect through other uh, shifting breeds like uh, the the uh, Gaal, I think it is the the bear where bears. You get um, uh, respect from them for having the totem of the bear, and you lose a kind of a, a little bit of respect from uh, the car uh, from the Garu for having the bear. But he's a he's a totem of strength. He's a totem of care. Okay, which kind of is this what I'm trying to? It's kind of nice that they got that, and because it, it, it's starting to bring them together in the sense that. They have a common goal in the sense that you know that when they met the bear in their dreams sort of thing and he starts talking to them this you know monstrous thing that comes out of the woods like this beautiful wooded glade uh, and just lumbers towards them and just sits down and haunt on his haunch sort of thing and observes them looking down at all of them sort of thing and and starts talking to them they're like oh my god this is just wonderful and i think this then started to unify them brought them together because Straight away we had like a flagpole that sort of like they, a banner that they could stand under and it kind of created unity, which was really lovely because, you know, they felt blessed, which was really weird because they actually sort of took this upon themselves and went, oh, wow, this is actually kind of cool. You know, it's given us an extra strength, you know, it's given us a uh, mother's touch uh, and it's done this and this for us. And, you know, it's we're, we're part, this is part of our story because on your rites of passage, you you're sent out there like like any tribe in in the real world the rites of passage for a, a child was to become a, a man to become the individual that they should be but within that they should find themselves and that's what the you know in the old rites of passage was was about that they find themselves who they are uh, and they can come back a man or they come back you know a grown up sort of thing so within this story the whole thing of this is that they learn something about themselves. And it was kind of cool, because as this story progressed, you started to see them fulfilling their own little destinies in the sense that discovering who they were and where they fitted in within the pack. Um, and it, I think it brought them strong, it made them stronger and it brought them together as the story developed. Now the Rites of Passage should do that. And that's the kind of thing that was the, the lovely part about it. But then, you know, it came to the point where they, they've got to stop this thing. And I want, I've done this story thousands of times and it was kind of, I say thousands of times, like loads of times. I kind of wanted it in that story for them to achieve something more. Sacrificing oneself for the greater good of the group. And if it meant losing a character, only one individual losing a character, I kind of wanted them to, to step forward and do it and it was amazing because as soon as the theurge is called because basically we did it where basically a group you know a, a load of wendigo come and join them other werewolves from other kerns come to help them fight um uh pentex that are in there and uh i kind of wanted them to step forward and when like this old theurge called for 
pack, you know, a pack leader to choose one among them to sacrifice themselves, their souls, their spiritual energy to to seal this rift, so to speak. Um, the pack leader stepped forward, the bone gnawer, but the lowest of the low stepped forward and said, I'll do it. And then all of a sudden the others went, no, 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 we need you. I'll do it, I'll do it. And it was like amazing to see them all step forward. And the arguments out of character that it created, not bad arguments, but look, you've done brilliantly for the pack. We really need you to do this. It was kind of cool. And then the bone lord just said, no. The player just said, no, I'm the pack leader. I got to make this choice and I'm not gonna sacrifice you guys. And he steps forward and sacrifices himself. Well, that moment was just amazing. It was a moment where they all sort of like knew something that, you know, that one of them had to die. And I kind of think killing off a character straight away in the beginning sets a tone where, okay, well, we're not, we can't do everything. We're not super invulnerable. We, you know, we're not, we can't stop bullets. We can't, you know, we are we are mortal in the sense that you know we're not like vampires where we live forever until we get killed but werewolves aren't immortal okay yeah they may live long they may be stronger and stuff like that but they they're like human beings in the sense that they're not immortal you know they may be able to take damage from bullets and lethal terrible damage and survive it but they're not more they're not immortal and it was kind of nice that they got to the point where they realized that making a sacrifice for someone else is just as important as surviving, you know? So it was an amazing part to the story and it really sort of pushed it further. So when they came back, uh, we introduced a brand new character for the Bone Nora and it, and it kind of also gave him a, a chance to really sort of think about what he wanted to play. Because we sort of sat there and I sort of, in the beginning, said, look, this, this is this character, this is what this character's all about, and this is this one, this is what this tribe book's all about. And I sort of gave them a choice to pick a book. But for this, t and I sort of helped them develop the characters and stuff, but this time it was about him going away, reading the book, and then going, do you know what? I want to come back as a Wendigo. I want to be a Wendigo. Uh, and I want to, uh, I'm still going to play Galliard, um, but... You know, because the idea is that we've got a nice rounded pack then. Um, and he said, but, you know, I want to play something different. Uh, I, I want to sort of research the the feel of what I'm going to play. Because to be fair, he's playing a Native American Indian. And there's a lot of respect and, hom you know, like uh, a lot of respect that goes with that. And he's really worked out his character brilliantly. You know, he's, you know, he's, he's a character that's all about tradition and stuff. He's a character that... Um, you know, wants to keep the old ways alive and a part of his human form uh, life is that he teaches uh, uh, dance, you know, uh, you know, Native American dance and stuff like that, you know, from the from the firesides, the powwows and stuff like that. He teaches, uh, you know, that form and keeps the story alive. Um, and, uh, and I kind of like that about it. It was really cool that he wanted to go that way. He wasn't just building a character that's like, oh, you know, I'm going to fight and trash everything and hate everybody. You know, he was building a character that wanted to keep tradition, old ways alive, which I thought was remarkable. But I think within the group, we still have this um, trouble with, I've got to win, I've got to win, I've got to win. And I don't think some of them have actually understood yet. It's not like 40k, where you've got two opposing armies, only one can win, uh, unless you get a draw. Uh, but it's more about it's more about achieving something together. It doesn't matter if they go up in rank and you don't, or you lose renown and you know they're gaining renown for doing stuff because your actions within the game dictate how the rewards are given out and how people interact with you. So there's still sort of some of them that are still like, oh, I've got to win this, I've got to win this, and they still haven't got round to that moment of well it's not about just you it's about the group um and i think once they get that in their heads they'll be a bit more relaxed i feel about you know what they do and and care about more about the group uh because they had that one instance where it's worked really worked out for them so we've done our rites of passage they've gained their first rank they're now you know uh uh, uh, a garu of no note so they have renown now so they you know they get some respect 
Um, you know, they're moving up the food chain and we've moved to, we did a little story and then we moved to the Valkenberg Foundation. Now the Valkenberg Foundation is a fantastic, fantastic scenario. A brilliant story, broken up into little tiny stories um, that lead you along the way uh, to solving the bigger, bigger issue. Uh, and the nice thing about this was that, you know, we'd done New York and we used the little scenario stuff in the back of New York. Um, and, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, there was like little murders, mystery stuff to, you know, to, to solve, uh, you know, meeting, um, traveling into the Umbra stories and stuff like that. So we wanted to get them more involved in not just, you know, this, the real world, but going into the spiritual world. Uh, we almost lost our Theurge there, uh, which was really exciting. Um, you know, and they've battled spirits. Uh, they've had to go and get stuff. They've been to uh, Pangea, you know, traveled the, the, the sort of like the, chaotic realms and stuff like that and all the little pocket realms that are there we've been slowly getting them into that where they've had to go and collect something from each one just so they get an understanding that things are different and not always the same uh, and things that they feel that are evil are not always evil um, because they just don't know they have no understanding of that so it's been kind of cool so we've now started the Valkenberg we've done uh, the first story which is the master story where they have to go and find masters and bring him back uh, and they become a questing they become the Valkenberg's questing pack uh, and there's a lot of honor involved in that and they get some uh, fetish weapons and stuff like that and some magical face paint or spiritual face paint and stuff and and as we call it a torch uh, <laughs> which is like a moon gleam thing it's like a fetish that basically at different stages of the moon is how powerful uh, the beam of all the brightness of this item is um, and, a, and a special weapon that allows them like a blade that allows them to attack uh, creatures in the spirit world from the real world which is just amazing so we've we've done that we that was an amazing story an amazing amazing story uh, it, oh, what could go wrong went wrong for them but what went right did really work out and plus um, some of the story like two or three two of the members weren't there so it kind of lost you know the the extra couple of people to help them solve things so we had to i had to tone it down a little bit but also keep it more keep it as just as exciting uh for them as possible um and then we battle masters there was a heroic moment where they're they're stopping this truck full of uh um loaded explosives going to the sept of the green uh to blow up the kern uh, and they're fighting on top of the truck in their werewolf krynos war forms um through the streets let's not go there um and uh and it was amazing you know and the and they managed to trigger the bomb uh the bomb went off and they they jumped to safety and you know they're saved and we kind of i've played around with the story a little bit just to make it, make it that much more exciting and then from there we went to uh uh the house that sam built which is a fantastic story which is i want them to get to understand about the lupus side of their nature, the wolf side of their nature. So in that story, which is all part of the Valkenberg, basically um, they're sent off to find um, some lupus wolves that were uh, part in the clinic and they've been set free to live their lives as wolves. And, you know, they meet them and, you know, they get to understand them and stuff. They photograph them and stuff like that. And they just got to gather research for this facility that they're working at. But that during the night you hear gunshots and stuff like that and, and vehicles and when they finally get there they find um, three of the bodies that have been skinned and their heads chopped off uh, and paws and just left there. Um, and they realise that it's the wolves that they've been sent out to, you know, that they were photographing that morning. Which is horrific because straight away they, you know, they're angry. You know, so they, they hear the traffic, they hear the vehicles, you know, firing off in the woods and stuff, or driving off into the woods. So they go after them. Um, uh, but one of the wolves is missing. And there's, they finally discover there's two, two vehicles, which leads them uh, to destroying one and the other gets away. And then it leads them to a, a mining uh, and transport facility where they discover that, um, that uh, the other vehicle might be uh, an address that they find there. And it's Sam Samuel Hates, which is a brilliant character. He's a, in later on in the story, he becomes like quite prominent. And you can bring him back. You should never kill him off. If you ever get a chance, don't kill him off. He's such a cool character. So we uh, 
So we go off after him and his house is booby trapped <laughs> to the nines and it's amazing. He's got like, he knows all about them. He's kinfolk. So he knows how the werewolf society will work and he, and he had kind of, he's angry at them because he's treat, he'd been treated really badly by Garu society because kinfolk are like, even though the genes in them, they don't transform. It's they pass it on and their child may be a Garu or their child may be born to be Garu, but they just haven't got the ability to change. And he was always jealous uh, of that fact. So he managed to find a ritual that allows him to become a Garu. And it's just, I won't go into the, the nitty gritty, but it's just amazing. Um, so they have to get into his building into his home and they have to survive all the traps now there's extra traps that i've added and stuff just to make it a little bit more exciting get them really riled up and angry uh really want to go for this guy and when they finally get to him he disappears and they're like no they almost had him and he just gets away so they then jump into the umbra after him and all hell breaks loose and uh, and when they finally he escapes uh, and when they finally get to go to him, he's gone. He's disappeared. He's he's gone, and it just drives them insane. So we've done that story, and now we're leading on to the next story, which I'm going to save for another day. But it's been kind of interesting to see how they progress and how well they're doing. And I just feel that I think as we get further, I think they'll get it more. They'll solidify as a group more but it's been kind of interesting to see people that have never played role play games or people that have only ever played one kind of system slowly getting their heads around how it should be played and how they interact with each other so it's gonna be kind of cool and i think you know at some point we'll do some filming uh, of sessions or we might put it up on twitch i don't know we're, we're still trying to work out how we're going to do it but uh obviously we're going to be playing other uh, role play systems i'm i'd love to get them into palladium uh, because Rifts was an amazing game. Um, I would love them to get around uh, to Mage. Mage is a beautiful game. It's complicated um, to get your head round, but once you get your head there and you get to understand how it works, uh, it's just phenomenal. So who knows? Who knows how it'll go? I'm probably going to be looking at some other systems. Uh, we might do a one-off uh, Cthulhu-esque type story, um, looking at different games and stuff like that, play maybe a Cthulhu game. Uh, we may try out uh, uh, something completely different. I mean, I, I think one session of Cyberpunk might be might be exciting enough to get them uh, playing in that as well. So guys, you be good, you be safe. I'm going to see you very, very soon. Take care.